everybody who is joining for this education presentation to learn more about Seattle Public Schools, Capital Levies, Proposition 1 and Proposition 2, which is on our February 8th ballot coming up. We have three amazing guests here tonight to present and give us a better understanding of these levies, as well as answer our questions. After the presentation, we will have an opportunity for Q and A. And if there's if there's a good moment and one of the the guest uh, speakers says this is a great time for questions, then what I'm going to ask is for you to raise your hand and I will call on you. Tonight we have Jolyn Burge, Seattle Public Schools Assistant Superintendent, joining us. We also have Richard Best, Seattle Public Schools Director of Capital. And we have Melissa Palethrop, who is a member, or not a member, I'm sorry, she lives in the 37th and is chairing the Seattle, the school's first campaign. Before I turn it over to JoLynn, I just wanna take a minute to mention some housekeeping rules. We want everyone's full attention on our guest speakers and we're gonna ask for you to please keep your mute button on to eliminate distractions. We ask for everyone to demonstrate respect and consideration for all. We ask to communicate openly and thoughtfully with others, listen well, and be considerate of the multiple, the multitude of views that may differ from your own. And this especially applies to our, our Zoom chat. And we'll be monitoring that just to make sure that we are using it as the positive collaborative tool that we really want it to be. So thank you. And I'm super excited to introduce Jolyn Birch from Seattle Public Schools. I'll now turn the floor over to her to begin with our main presentation. Thank you, Carrie. Good evening, everyone. We're excited to be invited here tonight to share with you some information. So just to clarify roles, school district employees can share information about the levies. We can't advocate a certain way about voting. We can ask you to remember to vote, but our lane is really providing information to you about the levies tonight. Uh, Melissa Pale Thorpe is from Schools First and she has a different role that she plays and she'll also be uh, sharing with you tonight. So let me get to my right <clears throat> screen here. Sorry, I had a lot of other stuff up. <clears throat> All right. And everyone can see that on the screen? All right, <laughs> good. So we're here tonight to talk about the 2022 school levy ballot. And we've been doing this in different forums really since September, just providing information and answering questions. So we'll talk a little bit about school funding, why we still need the levies, what are they for? Then there are two levies that are on the ballot. One is the educational programs and operations levy known as the EP&O levy. Um, sometimes we refer to it as the operations levy. And then the second is the BTA-5 capital levy, and BTA is Building Technology, Academic, and Athletics. So these are both renewals. These are levies that are currently passed and uh, collections are happening. And these being on the ballot in February, they renew existing levies. So they're not, they're not brand new. So a little bit about funding in Seattle. School districts are funded through state, local, and federal dollars. Uh, and we'll talk about what that looks like in a moment. But every three years, our district and most districts in Washington state, almost everyone except for maybe one or two, ask uh, voters to consider renewing operations levies, which are local property taxes. That's the only way, that's the only um, vehicle that school districts have in our state. Local levies, the capital levies, are also the main source, pretty much the only source for technology and for school building construction and improvements. And we'll talk about sp some specific numbers for you to give you some context. So all the funding generated by these levies stays in our school district. These are separate and different than the city family and education levy. So this was our 21-22 uh, general fund revenue picture. So you can see that the state provides almost 60% of our total revenue, but the next largest source is local tax or local levies. 
And so it's a significant component of our revenue. So property taxes have to be approved by the voters. There are two levies up for renewal in February on February 8th. One is the operations levy. It does fund operations not funded by the state and one supports technology and school building improvements. So let me just say that when you may have heard that McCleary was fully funded, what happened during McCleary is the state improved how much of an allocation they were providing for teacher salaries. But there are still a lot of different things that they have not improved for 30 or 40 years. The other thing is, is that they did cap our levies. So the operating levy is capped, the capital levies are not. The operating levy, we can, we are allowed to ask for up to $3,000 per student, but that's it. That's all we can actually ask for. And then we work within uh, what, what that provides. This really does, renewing the levies does continue critical funding for our students, schools, and staff. And we'll give you some really um, concrete examples. So a little bit about how our taxes compare other districts in King County. So this is a picture of what you saw on your October 21 tax statement. For, we have three levies that were currently approved in October. The expiring operations levy, the expiring BTA levy, and then the ongoing BEX levy. The capital levies, again, alternate on the ballot. The capital levies are every six years each. They overlap. The operations levy happens every three years on a regular cycle. So all told, all together, all of those things, operations, BTA, and BEX, had a rate of $1.84 per thousand, which is how taxes are expressed in, in the state of Washington and most other places. You can see for other districts around us in King County what their approved voter taxes were on their October uh, tax bills. So you can see all the way up uh, federal way with an approved tax rate of $3.63, Highline, which represents Burien, $4.50. So we do have a low rate per thousand, relatively speaking, because we have high value property uh, in our business core downtown. So a little bit more now specifically about the EP&O or the operations levy. Again, this levy is on the ballot every three years. And it really does bridge the gap between what the state provides and what the district needs. So some examples here, and then we'll go into specifics. Child nutrition. So our school lunch program, we generate somewhere between a two and $4 million deficit each year. Uh, we do pay for additional staff, uh, STEM, and career and technical education programs for students receive some funding. And then all of student athletics are completely paid for out of the levy. Uh, and the music and some other extracurricular activities also come out of the levy. But the main components are really basic education driven with it being uh, staffing and special ed and our English learner programs are the majority of what the operating levy is paying for. So the funding gap, one example. The state, we have 50,000 students this year in Seattle. The state funds nine nurses nine nurses for our 106 school buildings, and we are hiring 68 nurses. So this is part of what the levy, operations levy is backfilling, is there's no way a district our size can get by with nine nurses. And this is very typical. So you could prorate this to any district, maybe a district half our size would get four and a half nurses, but they'd have the same and similar gap. And each district has to decide how they're going to use levy dollars to supplement the staffing that they actually need to provide critical services to their students. Another example, um, custodians. We have over 3,200 classrooms. The state funding is providing 219 uh, funded positions. We employ 408 custodians. Special education. We have a budget of $180 million program. The state's funding 82 million. The feds fund about 14 million, this comes from the levy. It is the largest source uh, that we, the largest use of our operating levy. So a, a quick financial summary, the levy is based on student enrollment and legislative formulas. So again, 
we ask voters to approve up to the $3,000 that we may ask for legally. Uh, and so given that amount, our levy over the three years in the operating levy would raise $646.8 million. That is a rate of 74 cents per thousand. Um, of that 74 cents, we always ask the voters to give us a little bit of capacity because what you want is the ability if your enrollment grows to go ahead and collect for those additional students who come through your doors and who also need the $3,000 per student. So we ask the voters for a little bit of capacity that we actually do um, bring in if in fact our enrollment grows. But right now, based on our current enrollment and, and the current legislative formulas, of the 74 cents that is on the ballot for voter approval, we could actually collect 63 cents. And that additional capacity of 11 cents uh, would be for enrollment growth. And this is very normal for school districts to ask for this, this additional capacity. So the operating levy is really flat from the prior 2019. In 2019, we actually asked for additional capacity. It was brand new. We weren't really sure what the legislature was going to do with levy formulas, but that has kind of settled out. We know that we're at the $3,000 amount now. So we lowered the capacity that we were asking for. Um, that's one of the questions we've been getting. What was on the ballot that passed last time in 2019 was a rate of, a, I think, $1.05. Um, and this time we're asking again for 74 cents, of which we would be collecting 63 cents based on current enrollment. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Richard to talk about uh, the capital levy. Thank you, Jolynn. Um, so my name again is Richard Best. I'm Director of Capital Projects and Planning for Seattle Public Schools. I have uh, worked in this position since um, May of 2014 um, and worked on the BTA4, BEX5, and BTA5 capital levies. Um, to differentiate the BEX levies from the BTA levies, the BEX levies really do deal with um, school replacement, um, school modernization, um, while our BTA levies, whoops, I lost the PowerPoint, uh, Jolynn, um, our BTA levies really deal with uh, building systems. And when I say building systems, I mean things like boiler replacements, roof replacements, um, electrical service upgrades, um, uh, HVAC um, equipment replacements, um, and then the T portion is for technology. And then the A portion is really a double meaning, both for academics and athletics. And I'll note, uh, Jolynn mentioned this earlier, but capital projects and planning is fully funded by the BTA um, levy. All of our um, dollars that we spend are received from our levies. We get very minimal assistance from the state of Washington. Um, technology, uh, our Department of Technology Services, they get about 85% of their funding through the BTA um, or BEX levies. So just to, to create some awareness about um, our funding sources. Next slide. Uh, the way we develop um, a list of projects for our BTA um, levies is we actually work with a third party independent consultant who does literally an investigation of all the building systems at um, Seattle Public Schools, 105 schools. Um, we have, uh, and, and of those 105 schools, I'm going to say almost 40 are landmarked, meaning that they're older than 50 years uh, in age. Uh, that uh, consultant then puts a report together and um, he prioritizes um, the system's replacements as at end of useful life, nearing end of useful life, fair condition, good condition, um, and then brand new. He describes, uh, gives us a numerical scale and tells us um, what needs to be really considered priority one projects that are at the end of their useful life. We also work with a third party um, independent uh, cost estimating consultant to help um, uh, identify the costs that are associated with those systems so that when we um, put a financial amount in the levy, we know that it will um, cover that scope of work. Um, 
similarly, our um, Department of Technology Services implements a similar practice for technology needs. Uh, we work with our school board to design uh, to uh, develop guiding principles for what should be included in our um, levies. Um, looking at it, uh, our project recommendations through an equity lens. And then we have a public oversight committee that Capital Projects has to report to. Um, it's an oversight committee um, called the Bex BTA Oversight Committee. They hold us accountable for all the projects that we committed for completing in a levy that we indeed do complete those levies. In addition, our Department of Technology Services has a similar um, oversight committee. It is called the ITAC Committee, Information Technology Advisory Committee. Um, they too oversee the work um, that Department of Technology Services commits to uh, implementing in the levy. And then finally, we put a list together and we make a recommendation to our school board of the projects that should be included in um, the BTA levy. So next slide. So the big project that will be included in the, the BTA levy is the replacement of Memorial Stadium. Uh, we're looking at replacing the grandstands, the synthetic turf, and the lighting at this stadium. The memorial wall will not be demolished. It will be um, actually uh, repaired and um, the condition um, hopefully restored more to its original light condition. Uh, we do have money set aside as an allowance to address um, uh, the enhancement of that memorial wall so that it is, um, is um, modernized. Um, in addition uh, um, to the grandstand, some replacements, we will um, again be replacing the synthetic turf and the field lights. Next slide, Jolyn. Um, our schools also have um, uh, uh, playgrounds. Our playgrounds are now on a 15 year replacement schedule. So we have those included in the levy. And uh, then we'll also be making um, some um, site repairs to our stormwater systems and our conveyance systems um, so that we can um, make sure that uh, stormwater leaves our site and uh, does not um, create issues um, around the building perimeters. Next slide. Also included is building systems uh, envelope repairs. Um, we've got uh, windows and door replacements included in the le levy and window. And I'll note that again, our landmark buildings, that is not a simple process to um, repair the windows or replace the windows or replace the doors. Um, as part of our BTA-4 levy, we had uh, window uh, and door replacement at Franklin High School. That project is recently completed. We also had some um, below grade waterproofing improvements that needed to be implemented at Garfield High School. Um, and then also the refurbishment of the doors. Um, you can see pictures of the uh, refurbished doors at Garfield High School in, in the top picture there. Um, roof replacement we've talked about. And then masonry, lots of folks think that if you have a masonry building, it requires no repairs. Um, you actually have to put a water repellent coating on masonry, much like you paint your house every 10 to 15 years. And so we have our schools on a 15 year schedule to be um, have a water repellent and a graffiti coating put on. Or if it's not masonry, but it's actually a wood siding or a cement hardy board siding to be painted every 15 years. So next slide. Um, Included in the BTA levy is also um, safety and security improvements. Uh, we do have seismic improvements that we've identified at several schools. Um, seismic uh, codes are constantly changing. The 2018 building code had some enhancements to uh, the seismic codes. We look at uh, what schools, we work with a structural engineering firm to identify what schools um, are potentially at risk in the seismic event, and we uh, uh, imp implement the improvements that they identify um, as part of the levy. Um, uh, the, the funding comes from the levy in, in order to implement those improvements. Um, we have fire alarm systems, fire sprinkler systems, and then security, we really take a, 
a four prong approach. I mean, security has, we, we like to create secure entry vestibules to our schools so that when you enter into a school, you're actually forced into the office um, pretty much seamlessly. Um, we have security cameras, window and door intrusion alarms, and then an AI phone so that you can actually be at the front door, call into the office and they can um, buzz you in. So next slide. Um, during the COVID pandemic, one of the things that's been highlighted is the importance of uh, building ventilation systems. And, well, and our building ventilation systems are in, are in good condition. Um, we do have some systems that we did augment with HEPA filtration. Um, and then I will note that the CDC has uh, recommended that MERV 13 filters be in our um, air handling units. And so we are upgrading air handling units to include uh, MERV 13 filtration, replacing some, upgrading others. And then those areas uh, where we have provided the HEPA filters, um, we're also looking up at uh, upgrading um, the mechanical equipment that serves those areas as well. We also have plumbing, electrical lighting improvements um, planned, and then uh, intercom systems as well. Next slide, Joanne. Jolyn. Um, other projects, this is a, a picture of a secure entry vestibule at EC Hughes, where you're actually forced into the office before you can enter into the building. Um, we have an ADA survey that we'll be implementing at approximately 75 schools. Um, ADA was passed in 1991. It stands for the Americans with Disabilities Act. It provides some code regulations that we need to follow so that our buildings are accessible to all. Um, we um, are not going to be looking at the projects that were completed in BEX 3, BEX 4, BEX 5, but we're going to be survey surveying all the other schools in the district to make sure that we are in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Or if we're not in compliance, we have put an allowance in the levy to begin implementing those projects and would also um, continue that effort in our BEX 6 capital levy. Um, we also have um, um, restroom improvements, um, clean energy improvements. And then here at the John Stanford Center, we serve 65 of our elementary schools and, K and uh, 12 additional K-8 schools from uh, the kitchen located at this building. We're gonna be making some upgrades to that central kitchen. Jalyn, do you want to take the capital, uh, the technology portion, or would you like? Nope, I can do it. Thanks, Richard. So Thanks. our director of technology was not able to join us tonight. I'm going to step in for him. Uh, to give you some perspective, capital levies do fund 80, 85% of our IT department. There's about 130 staff that work in our IT department. The state provides funding for three FTEs. So it's pretty common. While we roll our, roll our technology into our capital levy and have named it as such for many years now, you may see other districts, they have standalone technology levies where they ask voters for something that's just specifically for technology. So we're a little bit different there where we roll ours with um, our capital levy. We do have uh, guiding principles. We are very equity focused on how uh, improvements and dollars are spent. How are we getting those to our students for some educational justice? There are three main areas of work. So student learning and support is really about student devices. And then all of our licenses, we buy 60 or 70,000 licenses for both staff and students. Uh, we're running about 90,000 devices across our district today. The district systems and data, again, all of our payroll, our accounting system, all the backbone systems, the student information system, which you may know as PowerSchool. If you're an elementary parent, you may be familiar with Seesaw. Uh, so there's different, both student data systems, student learning management systems, and then the district backbone systems to run our um, enterprise. And then our infrastructure and security, this is really about our network and cybersecurity components. So all taken together, that's really what the BTA and the BEX levies fund. There it, we have had a significant increase in our tech costs due to um, going to one-to-one, -to -one, which meant 
Before the pandemic, we had started implementing one-to-one -one devices. So one device for one student at some of our high schools. The pandemic accelerated that and we issued another 40,000 devices the summer that the pandemic first started. So that would be the summer of 2020. Um, that increased what we thought we were going to be spending and it took us right to a one-to-one -one, um, where we had anticipated moving to that over the course of two or three more years. So we are managing about 91,000 devices currently across the district. Back to you, Richard. Great. And then the athletics academics uh, portion of the levy uh, focuses on field replacement, um, field light um, upgrades, and, and then also athletic equipment, arts equipment, and science equipment. We have all of our equipment now on replacement schedules. I'll note that the field lighting is really uh, projects that were part of the high school bell time uh, programmatic environmental impact statement. Seattle Public Schools made a commitment to provide field lights at our secondary schools in recognition that moving the bell time one hour later in the day at our high schools would impact um, community use of our, of our fields. And so we have completed a uh, placement of athletic field lights at all of our high schools. We are still in the process of installing athletic field lights at our middle schools. And so that's, um, this levy will actually complete uh, that endeavor. Next slide. Um, so the proposition two, uh, the staff recommendation was for 783 million over six years. Um, again, it addresses the priority one projects that were identified by a third party consultant. Uh, it has an assessed uh, or it has a rate of 47 cents per $1,000 of appraised home value, uh, which is an increase of four cents over uh, what was collected in the BTA4 capital levy in 2016. And again, as Jolyn noted, the COVID pandemic really accelerated our um, implementation of one-to-one -one, uh, computer devices for our students. And so, uh, and literally has doubled the amount that um, was included in prior levies. And so we believe the four cents is a, um, a good value for um, the public. So open it up. We're gonna go to questions and answers, but just to give you more information, we do have a page on our website that you can go for additional information. And it does have a list by school of all the projects. Thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and take a, a moment just to hit a couple questions that have come in previously. And then I will go to James, you will be next. One of the questions that came in is like Sky Valley, does Seattle schools have any safety issues with PBC, PCBs, et cetera? Um, no, we do not have any um, issues with PCBs. Uh, that is um, a, a chemical product that we um, did analysis on um, long ago. It was primarily in lighting ballasts. Those lighting uh, ballasts have all been um, removed. So we have no PCBs um, in our schools. Next question. Regarding athletic equipment, does the levy pay for such things as football gear, helmets, protective um, yeah. sports equipment. No, it's not paying for uniforms. It's not paying for helmets. What it's paying for is things like football sleds, uh, something that you'd pay, uh, replace once every 20, 25 years, uh, soccer goals. It will, uh, um, um, replace, uh, basketball hoops and gymnasiums and gymnasium curtains, you know, that separate so you can have two games of basketball. That's the type of athletic equipment we're talking about. We're not talking about student uniforms. We're not talking about helmets, uh, baseball bats or anything of that. We're talking about large purchases that our co-curricular and physical education departments can't make on an annual basis. So can I just add one more, one more piece to that, Carrie? So Richard Wood is addressing what's paid for out of the capital levy. The operating levy does pay for some of those things. <laughs> so the operating levy does pay for uniforms um, and the type of equipment that's not considered capital. It really has to be like a $5,000 item or bigger to qualify for the capital levy. Otherwise, we pay for it out of the operating levy. 
Fabulous. Thank you. James Fackler, I see your hand raised. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. So um, I've got a whole bunch of questions. And I think I emailed some over to you, Carrie, because I thought we were going to be asking these questions or presenting them to them. And, you know, some of my questions are probably going to be hard hitting and, and uncomfortable for people. And so I, you know, first up, I just want to say that I appreciate all the hard work that, that you, Carrie, are doing, that, that the folks running 37th Dems are doing, and the to the to the good work that the folks at Seattle Public Schools are doing. Um, you know, Seattle has a long history of <clears throat> outcomes that are unequitable for communities, for communities of color, um, and and then in in even in a stark divide uh, of the ship canal, right? Um, you know, we also have um, we we have inequitable inequitable distribution of funding, and we have uh, schools that are um, in stark contrast to each other. You know, from schools in the South End to schools in Madison Park, and the amounts of money that PTAs are able to raise. Um, and so I heard you guys talk about some equity and it's great to talk about equity, but I'm wondering how are we living equity um, and, and what plans do we have to change the funding schemes that we currently have for PTAs? Is there a plan in this levy? Is there a commitment from the school board to change the funding schemes and have actual equitable distribution of PTA funds to all schools so that we can achieve equitable outcomes for all children, including low-income families in the South End? Thank you, James. Uh, so I'll start by saying that this levy is not going to necessarily address all of the PTA issues, but there's some other things in progress that hopefully will. But what we have done is certain components to things that we know are primary examples where a PTA that can raise a lot of money has given money like for playgrounds. We now include funding in the levy for playgrounds, specifically to your point, for those places who don't have a PTA to raise those dollars. And that was one of the equity issues that we were trying to address. Um, Richard can talk about Rainier Beach and how that was based on our equity tiering and the scoring that was put on for the first time in BEX-5. We included some type of a rating factor that said, who are you serving? Are you serving students for this from educational justice? And that actually moved Rainier Beach replacement building up and it's currently underway. To your other point, there's policy 6114 that talks about PTA funding. We are in our second year of a participatory budgeting process that those contributors who represent communities of color have come back with a recommendation to the school board who they're still discussing it. But I can tell you that the recommendation was to put some type of a uh, distribution model on PTA funding where a PTA would raise, you know, um, $12,000 and maybe 3,000 of the dollars would go into a district pot where the community would have a board that redistributed that to other high need schools. So those are some of the things that we're trying to do to address those equity concerns, which are real, and you're spot on. So, James, I'll just add um, also from a capital projects levy standpoint, and in both the uh, BEX4 and the BTA4 capital levies were really addressing um, expanded student enrollment over a very short period. Literally, we added about 10,000 students uh, between 2008 and 2014. And we were playing catch up, you know, we were trying to build permanent ho uh, housing in schools for those students in lieu of adding portables. Uh, that, the focus of the BEX4 levy was literally to try to reduce the number of portables at Seattle Public Schools. Uh, since I've been here and I've only been here eight years, I have added over 100 portables. We have gone from um, uh, 187 portables to two, 289 uh, portables. With our uh, B, uh, BEX-5 levy and our BTA-5 um, capital levy, our board implemented a levy um, uh, into the equation in which projects were selected, uh, uh, an equity analysis. And so, uh, as Joan Lynn noted, that helped determine the projects that were included in the BEX-5 capital levy. And I'm just going to name several of them really quickly that are in your legislative district. Van Esselt uh, interim site. It's an interim site for our schools in the South End, similar to what we have in the North End at John Marshall, similar to what we have 
in West Seattle at Schmitz Park Elementary School right now, where we have a permanent location in which we're gonna house students when their schools are being renovated. Then we have Mercer Middle School as part of um, the Bex Five Capital Levy. It's gonna begin construction in 2023. Um, it is uh, currently under design. We have um, Rainier Beach High School, as Jolyn indicated, um, that is going to begin construction this summer, 2022. It will be complete um, in the summer of 2025. It's a two-phase project. Um, the school asked to remain on site uh, when we were building the new um, school, and so we honored that. It's a two-phase project that's extended the schedule for one year, but it'll be complete by 2025. Then we have Aki Kurosi Middle School that we are going to begin design this year of a modernization of that school that will begin construction uh, in 2025. So uh, lots of work that will be occurring in our schools in the South End to address some of those equity issues that you highlighted. And our school board um, is very aware of um, those concerns um, from the broader community. And Richard, I just add Kimball's vacant right now because it's being replaced. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to go to the next question. Diane Ramsey. I think you are still on mute. I am. Excuse me. Okay. So I'm not sure whether this is a question for Jolyn or not, but in September, September of 2020, Moss Adams issued an internal audit review. They issued their final report. One of the recommendations was that the Audits and Finance Committee include uh, at least two members of the public. Uh, and then just now, the B Bex BTA Oversight Committee was identified and the ITAC Oversight Committee. So I have two questions. Do these First, do the Bex BTA Oversight Committee and the ITAC Oversight Committee, do they have any public, any members of the public on those committees or, and, and or are those committees, uh, the, the meetings available for the public? And then what is the status of the Moss Adams? Uh, they made a 14 observations and recommendations. One was that two members of the public be on a, an oversight committee for the audit and finance group. What is the status of the transparency for these three committees? So the, the Bex BTA and the ITAC committee are both are primarily community members and students. So there's students on ITAC as well. And then we do have um, one of two outside um, participants, so stakeholders on the Audit and Finance Committee. Um, we had limited response. We started during the pandemic. And so it's, it's on pause until we're, we're hoping to go back out and get a second person uh, nominated. But we do have one uh, that's been serving for several months now. And so that has been addressed. And so are these meetings available for the public to view? Are they Zoom meetings? And when do they happen? Or how can we find them? Yeah, so they are Teams meetings. We use Microsoft Teams as the, the way to deliver those online meetings. And they're all public. They're published on our various websites. The, all the, the audit and finance committees are on the board page. And then I believe the BEX and BTA meetings are on the capital page. And the ITAC meetings are on the IT page. And that, that would give you reference to those committees and their meeting schedules and their meeting minutes. And I can note, Diane, that the Bex BTA Oversight Committee meets the second Friday of every month from 8.30 to 10.30. And as Jolyn indicated, it is on um, our website, the Capital Projects and Planning website. And you can put in search Bex BTA Oversight Committee in the district um, search engine, and it will go to that. Um, there are 11 members of the public that serve on that committee and two school board members. Um, that serve on that committee. And you know, it has been an absolutely um, fantastic group of individuals to work with. They are truly subject matter experts as relates to design and construction 
and they hold us accountable. And they also hold us accountable, not only financially, but making sure we're looking at our energy usage, our carbon footprint um, of our buildings. Um, and then we're making sure that we're communicating with um, our, our, our regulatory agencies to make sure that we're addressing their code concerns. So, And, and where might I find the response to the Moss Adams uh, audit? Because once they do an audit, they make observations, they make recommendations, and then somebody from the school district needs to respond to each one of those findings. Where might I find that? I believe it would be on our internal auditors page. He, the internal audit that we have generally leads and coordinates the audit response. So that's one thing I'm gonna have to check on and get back to you about. Okay, thank you. Jolyn, if you want to send that to me, I will make sure I get it to Diane. Will do. Thank you. And everyone, everyone should have that. Absolutely, absolutely. I just want to make sure that we'll we'll make sure all our members get it, but Diane, we're, we'll make sure you get that as Thank well. You. Nancy, I see your, your hand raised. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the um, guest speakers. At the beginning of the presentation, uh, this is very informative, um, you mentioned that you were only allowed to raise $3,000 per student. Is that a Washington state, um, something that the state tells you? And it just seems like since we are, we perennially have a funding squeeze, what, what could we do to raise that? Yeah, it would take legislative action. So when they did the levy swap, with McCleary, the last piece of funding McCleary, which was really teacher salaries. Uh, they changed the construct of how and what school districts can collect for local levies. Previously, there hadn't been a limit. They did put a limit on that now. They, they um, <laughs> there is, there is, they believe what they fund is basic and anything past that is enrichment for a district. I would say I don't feel like nine nurses for, for my district is basic. I don't feel like 10 is basic. I, I need 100 for this district. So there's some differences in opinion, but it would take legislative action to change. And we actually um, we have the highest authority in the state. Other districts can collect $2,500. So our legislators did go out and asked for Seattle to be able to raise 3,000 because we'd had a lot of people say that's simply not gonna work for us. Still not enough. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, James, I see your hand raised, but I'm gonna go ahead and call on Joanna so that we um, we will do one question each and then James, I'll come back to you. Okay, I'm just, um, so most of the videos behind the Teams meetings, you can't, access unless you're on a certain team's group within the school district. So I don't think those are really accessible. I can see minutes on some of the meetings. And she asked about three different, so I can see the Beck's oversight, but she asked about three different committees. So I'm still curious about where I would find those. And I'm still advocating that those meet, that when you have public that the public meetings be the videos be accessible the conversation um, that's my question. yeah I remember your question Joanna yes and I have been advocating for that for quite a few years in different ways and at different times so uh, right now that decision rests with our school board I, I will say that and I would note Joanna I do not believe that the Bex BTA oversight committee meetings are um, recorded. Um, we keep uh, me uh, meeting minutes of those um, what occurs at that meeting, but you are you are able to attend that meeting. Um, but I do not believe it's a recorded meeting. Well, and of course, I've had an issue with the uh, work sessions. Not I know they're recorded and they're behind a wall. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanna. Um, James and let's see, I think we lost. Oh, Mateus, sorry, I misspoke. Go ahead. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so as uh, you know, as we saw with the with the students, I think it was was it from Franklin that were that were um, um, you know held a rally at, at at John Stanford requesting additional uh, funding and access to counselors. Um, you know, we're in. I think we can all agree that we're in an unprecedented um, situation where where you know. I mean, I think we've all effectively been traumatized by the the COVID quarantines, right? You know, this has been a traumatic experience um, for, for everybody. And, and certainly, certainly for students going back to school, you know, people, people sort of re-entering community after being um, quarantined at home, um, you know, are, are suffering from anxiety and, and other stuff, right? Um, you know, as well as what we've seen with, with, with kids with, you know, from school shootings and, and, and focuses on mental health. Um, what is, you know, I see that there's money for, I see that there's, I see that there's money for nurses. I see that there's money for custodians, but I don't see anything in there for counselors and, and, you know, equitable access to counselors, uh, additional counselors, given, given the current situation, what kind of funding out of this operational levy is going to support counselors at Seattle public schools? Um, and then again, you know, equitably. Thank you. Sure. So we do have a few more counselors paid for out of the levy. I did not highlight everything that the levy pays for. I just gave some, a few examples, but, but not every example. Um, we do have counselors at all of our high schools and middle schools, and we have counselors at the majority of our elementary schools. So all of our equity tier one uh, elementary schools, and those are schools with the highest number of students uh, for this educational justice or students of color students in poverty, those all have counselor, well, they have social workers in elementary schools, really. It's about that mental health support, not, a, not an academic counselor. So they have those in place. We do still have 29 schools that do not have a counselor allocated to them. We have increased counselors about by 20 positions over the last couple of years, um, but we still need more. That, that's an accurate statement. And we, it's something that's in the governor's budget proposal uh, so there's a bill currently working its way through the, through the legislature. We strongly support that bill. It would provide another, it would pay for another 100 FTEs that our levy is currently paying for in the categories of guidance counselors, social workers, school psychologists, which school psychologists, the state funds us 1.4 school psychologists and we hire 60, more than 60, and then nurses. So those are some other examples of where the levy is um, stepping in. So is that, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, I just want to respond to that real quick or ask kind of more clarifying question about that. Is there money to, and is there ability to, since we've heard from the, the most impacted folks, which would be, you know, really, really, you know, our high school students have the most experience with the educational experience in Seattle public schools and are, and are really, if we talk about subject matter, matter experts, high school students are subject matter experts in uh, educational outcomes. Right. So if, if we listen to those those children, right, those those young adults and what they're saying is that we need more counselors. What what is Seattle Public Schools commitment to to listen to those subject matter experts and meet their needs? Yeah. Are we going are we going to be able to tweak the budget? Is that something is that something we need to, to lobby at, at the school board to do? You know, I mean, it's, it's one thing to punt it to the legislature, but we have the ability to, to do that within our own purview and with, within you know, it seems to me within the own, with our own budgets, right? Is there, is there a priority to listen to those kids? There are priorities, but there are limitations too. I'm just gonna be on, straight up with you. There are limitations with how we can go about meeting those ratios. So one of the things that we have to balance is we do have collective bargaining agreements that we have to meet the ratios for, and that does direct dollars to certain places in certain ways. Can we fund more counselors? Yes. Right now, the focus seems to be um, going in the direction of restorative justice. So that is the area that participatory budgeting and those contributors identified as the area that they would like to work on is restorative justice. So including more positions for restorative justice in our schools, which are not directly mental health counselors, but, uh, but we understand from our students that those are supports that they value and feel like they need an increase on as well. Thank you, James. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the next question. Appreciate that. Uh, Mateus, go. 
Uh, hi. First of all, thank you for coming in. This has uh, been super informative so far, so I really appreciate it. Um, I was just wondering, is there an easy way to get an overview of the um, spend per student per category in that over, you know trend over the years? And then also where we can compare this to what schools that have really great outcomes or districts that have really great outcomes Right, where do we, so that we can see where do we fall short or where are we maybe spending more? You know, I think that would be really helpful to articulate and set the context around um, these asks. You know, when I talk to people about why these are important levies to to vote for, you know, that would just provide more context. Is there a way to get that information? Yeah, the state. Um, so before I came to Seattle, I was a CFO for the state Department of Education. And during my time there, we developed a per pupil tool where you can go on their website and you can look up the spend by district and identify the per pupil amount. So uh, that's one thing I'll deliver back to Carrie is the direct link. It may, I don't know how difficult it might be for you to find it on their website, but I'll just give you the link directly to the tool and then you can look up um, district by district, our district compared to other districts. It'll tell you how many positions of different kinds we fund and all of that stuff as well. And I will make sure we get that out to all of our members. Thank you. Is, is there a way to, now one thing is to look at the inputs, right? And the other question is how do you contrast that with the outputs? What are you getting for that money, right? It's yeah. you can't really assess it just based on the inputs. Is there a good way, and maybe there's none, to actually understand how the inputs relate to the outputs? Well, there's also a tool where you can look up assessment scores and assessment scores have pros and cons, right? I'll just want, I just want to say that a lot of um, our families of color do not believe that assessment tools are um, equitable, um, that they're biased. So they come with all of those uh, caveats. But again, I'll provide you the link on OSPI's website. There's a way that you can look up our scores by, by district and by school, and you can compare it to other districts and other schools. Thank you. I, I would just mention the roadmap project also does that across districts, um, proximate to one another, and that might be helpful. So Melissa, I know we, I wanna first ask, are there any more questions for our guests, both Richard or JoLynn, before I move on to Melissa, who I'm really super excited to um, hear from. I see what, I see James, you have a question? Yeah, so this this is kind of like my third third group of questions. I really appreciate you guys. Um, I you know it's just education is is near and near and dear to me. My my parents, uh, my mother was a, was an educator, um, you know. But I but I struggled in school, right? I I struggled um, in 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 having successful successful experiences in 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 high school, and um, you know one thing for me that that you know and and I work in the building trades, um, you know. And one thing that that you know, as as a child, as a young adult working in shop class, offered meaningful experience to me. Uh, stuff that was outside of the, the the traditional educational experience per se, but but afforded me skills and and gave me great great self confidence. Um, you know, I I work in the building trades, um, and and see that there is such a need for skilled workers. We're talking about spending nearly a billion dollars on skilled workers in this capital, capital budget or, you know, so what are we doing? How are we improving our educational experiences for hands-on learners? How much money is being allocated to shop classes? Are we increasing shop classes? Is there capital funding directed at shop classes? Um, what are we doing? What are we doing? How are we, how are we supporting the trades? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, my partner has said similar things to me and has had similar experiences. So know that I, I, I hear that and um, those are valuable skills that we need more of. So we have frankly had uh, trouble getting kids interested in, in traditional shop classes. We do have a skill center as well and our skill center they do offer different types of classes and they continue to evolve what those course offerings are. But the exciting piece is that we recently signed um, a resolution to have a pre-apprenticeship program 
And in that pre-apprenticeship program, it directly ties with the building trades and gives our students brand new opportunities. So Richard, I'm gonna let you speak to it after that. Yeah. So I would just say also, James, that uh, the district has entered into a student community workforce agreement with the Seattle Building Trades Council. And the focus of that student community re, uh, workforce agreement is really working with our construction partners to create awareness around the district CTE programs, around the skill center programs, and around the pre-apprenticeship programs. And uh, working also with the um, labor unions to create that awareness as, as well. Um, we meet monthly with the Building Trades Council and our construction partners. Uh, we're now working in our CTE um, educators as well um, and a skill center principal into those conversations as well so that we have a cohesive approach to present to our student population, uh, trying to create awareness about the building trades as a viable career pathway. Um, there is a recognition at Seattle Public Schools that not every student is on a college pathway and we want to create awareness around the building trades as a very viable um, living wage job career pathway for those students who may not be on um, a pathway to go to college, but also for those students who are on a pathway to go to college as maybe this is another alternative um, when you decide you don't wanna be an accountant or you don't wanna be a lawyer, the building trades, all you have some awareness about the opportunities that are being offered there. So we started this program in uh, really November of this year, but I wanna say both the um, uh, construction partners that we're working with, and there are seven or eight, um, any project greater than um, $5 million, we're working with those um, contractors and the Building Trades Council have been great to work with so far. And uh, you will be hearing more about this, but more importantly, our students will be hearing much more about our CTE offerings and our skill center offerings. Just just real quick, do you guys have apprenticeship requirements on your projects? Are, 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 are we do. I know that we do. So what, what is that? How does that, how does that, what does those typically, what does that, what are those requirements? I mean, I know that like the 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 stadium the, the Kraken Stadium and that and um and there's other there's other projects that go that get negotiated with funding that that have apprenticeship requirements as part yeah. of their part of their agreement. So we have you know the state law has a minimum of fifteen percent um, as an apprenticeship requirement. Our projects are generally greater than that. They're generally around eighteen percent. But this is something that we are tracking on a monthly basis. You know, is there is there is there a way to increase that in our contracting so we get more opportunities to, to local youth? I uh, would have to work with our construction trade partners because our projects are design bid build um, for the most part or GCCM, which is another form of design bid build. Um, but definitely our trade part, our construction uh, partners are definitely aware of that as a I'm a desire both for Seattle Public Schools and then also you know they're recognizing. Um, that the, the importance of having, you know, availability to labor. And really it's the pre-apprenticeship programs that we're focused on to get students into our pre-apprenticeship program so that then we can get them into the apprenticeship programs of, of um, the local um, building unions. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. I would now like to introduce Melissa. Thanks. And, and I'll be quick. I know it's it's been a long meeting. It's really great to hear all of your questions. Um, I'm here at Melissa Pelter, I currently chair the school's first committee. It's a citizen-led committee that rallies every three years to get out the vote for the levies. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of the 37th. I went to school at a time when maybe some of you remember the old Maple Elementary on the south end of Beacon Hill and actually the top floor was condemned so we couldn't use it. We used portables in the first floor and I'm glad Seattle's come a long way since then. Um, so I've attended school in many, many of the buildings in Seattle and seen firsthand, you know, what happens when we do and don't have the support to uh, really provide safe, secure environments for our kids. Um, I think, you know, you've probably heard a lot of information, a lot of details about these levies. Uh, my takeaway is a whole lot of thought and effort goes into preparing these. It doesn't 
start the year of the levy. It's a several year process to put these together. I think what's really important to remember is these are replacement levies and 15% of our operating budget comes in Prop 1. And without that, our kids won't have the supports that we've been talking about tonight. And replacing those isn't an option with other funds. So I think that's just really, really important. While we all wish our state funding formulas did a better job of providing for all kids, you know, they don't. And we need our local levies. Um, I would add to that, you know, we need, again, safe, secure buildings for our kids. Uh, we need an earthquake proof memorial stadium. Um, we are hearing about lots and lots of the projects that are being addressed in the South End. That's really great. Some that are coming up to the next cycle when we do the building excellence levy um, is likely to, to feature both uh, more work on Aki and then Washington Middle School as well, which has long, long needed replacement. So I'm um, just, you know, encourage you to pay attention. Uh, I think, you know, the biggest, uh, biggest uh, opposition we have in this levy is just uh, uh, apathy more than anything else. You will see some signs around town uh, encouraging people to vote no, I would argue, and maybe you've realized in listening to this, those are just factually wrong. <laughs> um, and it's really important to pay attention and educate your neighbors and um, really get those ballots in. I'm just going to put into chat some other ways that you can help. So, um, oops, where's chat? Uh, you know, there's more information about the campaign itself. Oops, on um, school Seattle, uh, schoolsforseattle.org. Um, please go there and you can download information and sign up to help, which would be really important. I would say representation from the South End on the Schools Force Committee is thin. So we urge uh, people to connect and, and help us, particularly the next time around. Um, donations are real helpful of any size, and you can donate online. Sorry, the link didn't carry, but um, you can also go to our website, and there's online donation there. You can sign up there as well to help text banking on February 3rd. Um, if you want yard signs, I've got them in my driveway, 4403 51st Avenue South. There's a pickup truck there with signs and stakes take them. Uh, my encouragement would be to keep them for three years from now in your own garage. But if you want to bring them back, put them in my pickup truck, I'll keep them for you. Um, and then lastly, on February 7th, the evening, Monday evening before ballots are due on Tuesday, uh, me and some of my closest friends, and hopefully you too, will be waving signs at the Franklin High School overpass where we often see people promoting getting votes in. So um, any of those things would be welcome and just encourage you to participate, educate your friends, particularly those who don't have kids and make sure people get their ballots. Fabulous. Thank you so much. There was one question that popped in and it was, if the levy doesn't pass, when can it be resubmitted and passed at the earliest? I think Joe Linwood or, or Richard might have a better sense of that. Uh, it's a pretty narrow window though. <laughs> Yeah, a new resolution would have to be passed by the board by February 25th for April ballot. Okay, perfect. And we have one question raised. I see Alex Stevens. Hi, Melissa. Thanks for coming. I, I, I just want to get something clear because you're with the campaign. Yes. And so I just like to know, did the campaign uh, approach us to come to present on this Um prior and I, I and maybe we you did know. uh yeah we actually um reached out in November um and I think you guys were having a change in leadership maybe and it sounds like things got lost in the cracks so um we did reach out so I'm not sure what happened there thank you I would like us all to give a warm thank you to all of our guests I am honored Melissa Joe Lynn, and um, I'm so sorry. I'm just like Richard. I'm just like, oh, where are you? <laughs> I, I just want to thank you. We are so appreciative. This has been incredibly educational, incredibly motivating, and we are we are we are just grateful. So thank you very much, Terry. May I just one other thing? Absolutely. Hi, Richard. Good. Hi, Richard. Good to see you in this forum. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. I saw you there too and uh, appreciate all the work you're doing. So, yeah. Thanks for having us. Thanks for inviting us. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Get those ballots in. <laughs> Absolutely. Everybody, get your ballots in.
Thank you, everyone. You don't even need a stamp. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you all very much. Hi, Carrie. Thank you for running a really good meeting. Oh, Evie, hi. Hi. But I am really shocked to hear that they tried to get on our agenda. And then we had that huge hissy fit at our last meeting that they hadn't tried. So that I did hear that they had tried to reach out. I don't know what contact information they had. Um, I'm super, all I can say is I can speak for myself. 